<clears throat> well, I've already read the text, so let's begin with a bit of review. Um, last week, as you know, was a different week. We watched a couple of videos because uh, basically I had the week off for my daughter's wedding. So this morning, we're returning to the book of Acts, and two Lord's Days ago, we were considering some of the encouragements um, that are in this passage for the spiritual warfare that we are involved in. We saw the powerful work that God was doing in Ephesus, remember, how the gospel was spreading through all of Asia, and how many were turning from idolatry and witchcraft and showing their repentance by uh, publicly burning uh, their, their magic books. Remember, the value of them was, was some uh, 50,000 pieces of silver, I think. But we also saw some serious pushback on the part of the enemy because he doesn't really take lightly the plundering of, of his house. He will resist, and sometimes that resistance can be severe. So as the sale of the silver shrines uh, of Artemis was dropping, Demetrius and the guild of craftsmen started a riot that became citywide, and it threatened the church's continuance. But the Lord stood up for His bride. The Lord said He would be with us even to the end of the age. He would be with His apostles as they preached the gospel. He would be with His church. And so He moved on the magistrate's heart to enforce the law. Because Paul and his companions had really not broken any law. They hadn't really spoken against Artemis or that particular form of idolatry. They were simply preaching the gospel. And so the rioters were dispersed. So again, the Lord protecting His church, giving encouragements. We don't have to be afraid because God is going to work all of these things for His glory. Now, He gave other encouragements as well. Remember, Paul worshipped in Troas, and that was what we looked at, I think, in Sunday evening two weeks ago. And when Paul comes to Troas, there's a church that has been established there, a church that wasn't there the first time Paul came through and saw his vision to uh, the man of Macedonia saying, come over and help. But now there was a church, a church that was meeting faithfully to worship the Lord on the first day of the week. Remember the day that our Savior set apart when He rose from the dead? Jesus says to us in the Good Shepherd Discourse in John 10, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I'm sure Paul was very much encouraged by the fact that here was a church that was following the voice of their master and worshiping him faithfully. He found there also a church that was faithfully breaking bread together, which means they were celebrating the Lord's Supper from week to week. We saw in the Bible that worship is often referred to as the breaking of the bread because every time the church met together, they would celebrate the table, which again is why we do that from week to week. But this is a reminder that the Lord had saved them, even as He had saved us, but also that He has made every provision necessary for us to do what He calls us to do in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our source of strength. We simply need to look to Him. And then lastly, we saw He also confirmed Paul's teaching that what He was giving them actually was God's truth. When Eutychus, remember, fell asleep because of how long the service went, I think it went for over eight hours, uh, he fell out of the window backwards and outside of the, the building, died on the street, and yet the Lord raised him again to life through Paul, proving that what Paul was giving to them were not uh, cleverly devised tales, as Peter says, but rather God's truth. When we want to prove that the Bible is the Word of God, what we need to do is, is point to the eyewitness accounts of these miraculous events, these miracles that the Lord did to confirm that these were, in fact, His messengers. So again, this was confirmed to them through this miracle that Paul was giving them the gospel. Now, this morning we see Paul continue to press forward towards Jerusalem. Remember, he wanted to be there, if possible, on the day, or at least for the Feast of Pentecost, but we know there were other reasons he wanted to be there as well. He knew there he was going to be arrested. We know that he knew there he was going to be abused and that he would eventually be taken to Rome. So we see that trip now as he's moving that direction. The first thing we see is that Luke, with Paul's companions, sailed from Troas to Assos, 
while Paul made the trip on foot. Now, Assos is a, a city that um, is about 20 miles southeast of Troas. Uh, Paul was taking that walk, not for his health, but likely hoping to find opportunities to preach the gospel along the way. I mean, this may be the last time he was in the area. He wanted to make sure that he could, you know, again, speak and share that good news. Now at Assos, Paul boarded the ship, and from there they sailed to Mytilene, which is an island further south off the western coast of Asia Minor. Then they went to Chios, and then to Samos, which are islands further south, and then to Miletus. Miletus is about 50 miles due south of Ephesus, about four days' journey. Luke notes that he passed by the city of Ephesus because he wanted to arrive in Jerusalem by Pentecost, didn't want to get hung up, as it were, in Ephesus. But we also see he didn't want to miss the opportunity to be a blessing to that particular church. And so from Miletus, he calls for the Ephesian elders, knowing that if he could simply minister to them, invest himself in them, that he could affect the entire church because these men were the ones who were going to be teaching and going to be pastoring those who were in Ephesus. So this morning, let's consider what, what he says to these elders. But let's begin with the three things that Paul points to in himself as an encouragement and as an example to the Ephesian elders. And as I mentioned earlier, as Paul wrote to the Corinthians, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. He wrote this to the Corinthian church as a whole. And what we see then in Paul is something that he wants us also to imitate. Uh, what we see of Christ in him, we should seek to put on. So what we're going to consider is this. First of all, his sincere labor for his Lord. Secondly, his willingness to lay down his life for him. And then thirdly, and perhaps again most soberingly, his innocence for the responsibility for the damnation of any. So first of all, he points to his sincere labor for the Lord. Now he begins by telling the elders that he didn't hold anything back while he was serving them in Ephesus in verse 18. You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time. Now remember we saw the Lord had brought Paul to Ephesus on his third missionary journey and Paul had devoted three years of his life ministering the gospel to them. Now there was a reason for that. He knew the city had strategic value. Ephesus was a huge city, I, I, hundreds of thousands of people. And it was from there that the gospel went out to the, the entire nation, the entire country of Asia. So again, it's strategic value. He also knew that the Lord was intending on doing something special there because this is where the Lord had sent that many Pentecost, many in the sense of small. Remember when Paul arrives in Ephesus, one of the first things he finds is a group of about 12 men who were aware of John the Baptist's ministry but hadn't heard about Jesus and so hadn't yet received the Holy Spirit. Well, out of, a, out of hundreds of thousands of people, Paul runs into these. And the Lord baptizes them in the Holy Spirit and gives them that power. And what he's essentially doing is giving to Paul a small core group of men. Essentially, as our Lord had 12 disciples, Paul now has these 12 Spirit-filled disciples in order to help him in this work. Some believe they may have been the earliest elders, perhaps some of these men that were meeting with him in uh, Miletus. And so again, Paul seeing what the Lord is doing there gives himself fully to this work. And by the way, we know Paul does that wherever he goes. He always invests himself fully. He doesn't hold anything back. Now our Lord tells us that gospel ministry requires this, this kind of effort. Okay, there's this work requires, of course, sowing seed, actually breaking ground in order to sow the seed, watering the seed, and then harvesting the seed. And we know that our Lord tells us that if we are faithful to sow according to the parable of the sower, that the seed will find its way into the good soil. But we realize this takes effort, doesn't it? It takes effort. It takes time. Paul was willing to invest that time. 
And we need to as well, again, we are called by the Lord to invest our lives in the kingdom. Now, secondly, he points to a character trait within himself without which his, really he would have been useless, something our Lord himself pronounces a blessing on in the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, and that is humility. He had served his Lord with all humility. Humility is the opposite of arrogance, this you know, air of superiority, this self-importance. The word means to be meek. It means to be gentle. As I was thinking about this, I, I was thinking about a series that I'm hoping we'll be able to watch together in the future. Uh, Dr. Michael Reeves on the English Puritans, very interesting. He was commenting how the Puritans believed that our demeanor was very important and how you know, our demeanor influences people the way that they receive us. And the, the, they asked the question, the, this question, when people look at us, does our face say, welcome? Or does it say, beware of the dog? Okay? Now, we need to be welcoming. You know, we, and, and gentleness really goes a long way in this area of people receiving us. Well, Paul was a, a humble guy, and he served in meekness, and they sensed that. He also served them with tears, and the fact that he did speaks volumes about his heart for them. Paul really cared about them. He really loved them, and they could tell that he loved them, that he wanted to see them come to Jesus and be established in Jesus and bear fruit for his glory in order that they might, in the end, receive a full reward. Now, that is really the most loving thing that Paul could do for them, is help them get established and be built up so that they can do what their Lord calls them to do, so that they can prosper for an eternity. Now, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 that without love, nothing we do is going to be pleasing to God. Nothing is, is going to be acceptable to Him. But it's also true that without love, we really can't make much of an impact on others. Okay, we need to love others. If, if we don't, we're not really going to reach out to them. If, if we don't, we're, we're not going to, to be able to do what, what we're going to see the very, last, the very last point is share the good news to them that is the only way that they're going to be able to escape the judgment that, that is coming. So Paul cared about them. He loved them. He loved all men. Jews and Gentiles, and that's why he was reaching out to them. And, of course, he loved his Lord supremely, and that's the reason why he was obeying that command and taking seriously the charge that had been committed to him. He was even willing to endure the hatred of his own people, his own kinsmen according to the flesh, the, the Jews, in bringing them the gospel. He endured the many trials that came at the hands of the Jews. Now, being hated by those that we care about, you know, especially those within our own family groups, you know, is often what stops us from reaching out to others. But you see, we have to be willing to pay that price, as Paul did, or they will really never have the opportunity to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we're faced with that, we should think about these two things. By sharing the gospel with them, yes, they might get angry at me. Maybe they don't want to be around me anymore. But if I don't share the gospel and they never hear it, they're going to go down into hell when they die and they're going to be there forever without any hope of being saved. Now, which of those two would you rather, you know, face? And, of course, when it comes to this last point, bearing some responsibility for their destruction, we need to choose the first option, share the gospel with them, even if they might get upset. Okay. Now, finally, Paul says he didn't hold back anything in his teaching, and that is finally under this first point. He taught them everything that would be beneficial for them, and I think we need to assume that means that over that three-year period, he taught them everything that he understood about God's truth, and Paul understood a great deal. And he gave not only those positive things that people like to hear, but also those more serious things that they don't like to hear, okay? Because all of those were beneficial. That's why the Lord gives them to us, because they benefit us. 
Now, too many pastors today will hold back certain truths. You've heard me refer to hell several times. There's a lot of pastors today that don't want to talk about hell. Now, we're not going to talk about it every single week, but we will when it's appropriate, right? Because it's real, and people are going there, and we need to try to help them not go there to save them from that particular eventuality. Well, again, pastors don't want to share those things because they're afraid it's going to turn people off. They're afraid they're going to lose some of their congregation. And, you know, especially the, the mega churches, not all of them, but many of them, compromise in order to keep a large group. And they do this especially in the areas of what God calls us to be perfect, holy, right? And what He calls us to do, share the gospel with other people, you know, uh, minister, serve. We need to be doing this. Lay down your life. Consider yourself dead for the sake of Christ. You no longer live for yourself, but for Him. And a lot of people aren't going to focus on that again because it's not popular to hear. But Paul didn't do this, okay? He knew they would never be established in the faith unless he gave them the whole counsel of God. And so he held nothing back. By the way, that's why we don't want to skip over any part of Scripture, why we often go through books verse by verse, chapter by chapter, because that way we can't escape anything the Bible says. We have to deal with it. Uh, and actually, we don't want to escape it. We want to deal with it. it. used to be in the past, you know, I would just pick those particular verses because nobody ever preaches on them. Okay, but we, we don't skip over those things here. And when we're ministering to other people as individuals, we want to make sure that we don't skip over those things as, you know, either. Because again, our, our brothers and sisters who go to other churches may never have heard those things and yet they need to hear them for their own well-being. Okay, so again, the first point is that, that Paul sincerely labored among them, and he did everything he knew that would be helpful for them to establish them. Now, secondly, oh, by the way, that's what he wanted <clears throat> them to do in their congregation, to minister to their flock, invest yourselves and your people the way that I have in you. Now, secondly, he points to his willingness to pay the ultimate price in doing this. Now, remember, his heart was set to go to Jerusalem. He didn't know exactly what was waiting for him there, but he did know that in every city, the Spirit had been telling him that he would be imprisoned and that he would suffer. As Jesus went to Jerusalem, which you know is the capital of the Jewish nation, also the center of their faith, to be rejected by his people and handed over to the Romans, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Paul is essentially doing the same. He's going there knowing that he's going to be bound, knowing he's going to be beaten, knowing he's going to be sent from there to the Romans in order to be judged. So he was compelled. He was under compulsion, bound in spirit on his way. He was determined that he was going to run this race to its completion, he was going to fulfill the ministry that the Lord had entrusted to him. By the way, he wanted to go to Rome so he could preach the gospel in Rome. But he was going to do this even if it cost him his life. Now, after Jesus told his disciples that he would be rejected by the leaders of Israel and killed and then raised again on the third day, he then turned to his disciples and he said this, and what he was saying to them he also says to us is that we must be willing to do exactly the same thing that he was doing. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me daily. Pick up the cross daily, die to yourself daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake he is the one who will save it. Now, that was not just for the disciples. And by the way, the disciples were more than just the apostles. They were everybody who was following Jesus at that time. Are we disciples of Christ? This is what the cost of being a disciple is, and that's why Jesus says we need to count the cost before we begin to follow him. R.C. Sproul calls the Christian life a disposable life. Now, we may not necessarily like the word disposable, 
But what he means by that is that we are completely at Jesus' disposal. He may use us however he wishes, even if that means we must die. What Jesus is telling us here is that for our part, we must be willing every day to give our lives for him. You see, that's what it means to be like Christ, which is what Christian actually means. It means little Christ, those who are like him. To be like Jesus means we're willing to lay down our life for his glory. Now, finally, Paul points to his innocence. And now this is, again, the, the heaviest thing we're looking at uh, this morning. He points to his innocence with regard to responsibility and the damnation of any. Now, he may have had in mind particularly those who are in Ephesus, but I think we could say it probably applies universally to his ministry. He says this in verses 26 and 27, Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Now, again, why did Paul say that to them? Because he wanted them at the end of their ministry to say the same thing, that they too were innocent. But how can you be? Well, we saw before that Paul said he held nothing back, no effort for their good or any truth for their benefit. Here he tells us that this was particularly true in his sharing the gospel, that he had shared it with absolutely everyone, that he would not be held responsible by God if any perished because he had freely preached both to Greeks and to Jews. Now, again, this idea of innocent of the blood of all men, what does he mean by that? Well, he's essentially saying, I will not be guilty for their blood if they perish. And what he's really alluding to here is what God said to Ezekiel. That's what we read in our meditation. Let me read it again, just one verse back, chapter 33, verses 7 through 9. God says to Ezekiel, now as for you, son of man, I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel. So you will hear a message from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. But if you on your part warn a wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your life. Now, what Paul meant here is that as God had commissioned Ezekiel to be the spiritual watchman for Israel, so Jesus had commissioned Paul to do the same for the Jews and the Gentiles. And as Paul was reflecting back over his ministry, he could honestly say that he had bought up every opportunity to preach the gospel to others. If anyone perished, it would be in spite of him and not because of him. Now, as I mentioned before, there is an application of this to us as well. And, it's, and again, it's a very sobering one. Jesus has also given us a commission, right? To take the gospel to all the nations. The, the Great Commission is essentially to reach every single person who is alive with the gospel. Now, we may not necessarily be called to a foreign country. You know, we think of missionary work as essentially being, you know, cross-cultural and going to another country like the Robins who went to Africa, the Fultas, which we aren't going to mention because of a sensitive area, and the Rich Lines who are down in um, Montevideo in Uruguay. But we still have a calling. We've been called to reach the people in this nation, in this country, okay? We have the same responsibility to share the gospel with those that we come in contact with, even as they do with those they come in contact with. Now, the thing is, when we fail to use the opportunities that God gives us, and I'm thinking here mainly not, not when we fail to you know, break the ice, uh, maybe, because we think of evangelism sometimes as just coming to people cold on the street and saying, something to kind of, you know, as an icebreaker and share the gospel with them, you know, that's not very effective. 
What is most effective, of course, is building relationships with people, building bridges, getting to know them, letting them get to know you, and just letting Christ come out of your life, right? Live like Christ, speak like Christ. Don't put Christ, don't put the gospel in the closet. Don't, you know, put your light under the, the bushel, as it were, under the, you know, uh, but rather let it shine, right? Well, let's say we do build those bridges. We do have these opportunities. We have these relationships, but yet we never actually share Christ with these people. What's going to happen in the end? Well, what God said to Ezekiel and what Paul is saying here is that we run the risk of being at least partly responsible for their destruction in the end. If they should never hear the gospel, okay? If we were the only possibility they had to hear it and we don't tell them and they never hear it, then we are partly responsible for their damnation. You know, the Bible says that there will be many in hell who fall into this category. They never heard the gospel. Now, they're not there because they didn't hear the gospel. They're there because they're, they're being punished justly for their sins. That's why people go to hell. It's not because they don't hear the gospel. But we need to remember the gospel is the only way that they could possibly have escaped that judgment. And if we had the chance, the opportunity, maybe many opportunities to tell them, but we didn't tell them, we kept silent because we were afraid of what they might think of us we will be part of the reason why they didn't escape. You know, when God tells the wicked man that he's going to destroy him, if Ezekiel warns them and they turn away, then God's going to have mercy on them, you see. But if he doesn't tell them, they won't turn away, and then God will judge them. But the, the responsibility for that death is partly on Ezekiel. We don't want that to be on us. Now, having said that, I think it's very likely that each of us here, maybe not all of us, but many of us bear some responsibility for some who are now in hell because we had those opportunities and we didn't share them. Now, thankfully, God is merciful. God is gracious. And when He says He forgives our sins in Christ, He forgives all of our sins. All of them are washed away, even that part that we played in, again, the demise of that individual. But the point I want to make is this. We shouldn't want to be responsible for anyone else from this point forward. We want to be able to tell people about Christ as our Lord calls us to in the Great Commission. That's what Paul was encouraging the Ephesian elders to do. That's what the Spirit of God is encouraging us to do. So in closing, let me just simply say this. Let's purpose by God's grace to follow Paul's example because each part of this really fits into this last point. Let's give ourselves sincerely to the work that God has given us to do, invest our whole lives. Let's be willing to be disposable Christians, so to speak, you know, at Christ's disposal, to be willing to lay down our lives for Him. You know, if we're, if we're willing to die for Him, how much more to suffer maybe some ill will from somebody we share the gospel with. And let's do our very best to share the gospel with everyone that he puts in our path, everyone that's within our sphere of influence, whoever those people may be in the family, in our extended family, our neighborhood, and in, in the workplace. You know, he's not saying go out there and just tell them point blank right now, but you, we do need to again develop those relationships and begin to let Christ come out of our lives and to speak to them about those things without which they will most certainly perish if they have never heard. Well, may the Lord apply His Word to us as we need to hear it. Let's bow in just a moment of prayer. And as we're praying uh, silently, let's also ask the Lord to prepare us to come to the table which means let's renew our faith in the Lord Jesus and our repentance uh, from all of our sins.